Whenever one has an I by J contingency table, one is often very interested in determining if the column response is, is dependent upon which row an item uh, falls in. In other words, one often wants to determine if Y is independent of X. Now, we're going to, in this set of notes, look at what independence means in the context of our two different ways of thinking about how contingency tables come about through using multinomial distributions. And we will look at two, actually three, excuse me, three different ways to do a hypothesis test for independence in an I by J contingency table. First of all, let's take a look at independence in the one multinomial distribution setting. What that basically means is that what happens for y doesn't depend upon what happens for x, in other words. So in other words, my joint probability that x is equal to i, y is equal to j, pi sub i j, is equal to my marginal probability for uh, x times the marginal probability for y. In other words, I guess I can go ahead and write this out. So what this is basically saying is that if I want to find this joint probability, the only thing I need to know is, well, what happens for X? What happens for Y? I don't need to know them jointly. Well, why then is this really important? Well, independence helps to simplify the understanding of these probabilities in a contingency table. You understand those probabilities, and this will lead to understanding your particular uh, analysis, or I'm sorry, your data problem that you are interested in. So now note that if independence was true, then in order for me to get all of these marginal probabilities for x, I would only need to know i minus 1 of them. Why? Well, because pi 1 plus plus pi 2 plus, oops, if I keep on going to the capital i version, these marginal probabilities sum to 1. So if I know, let's say, the first i minus 1 of them, I know the last one. Now, similarly, for the columns, I only need to know j minus 1 of these marginal probabilities to know them all. So in the end, for me to understand the entire contingency table, because independence is true, I would only need to know i plus j minus 2 of these probabilities. Now, if independence was not true, then I would need to know i j i times j minus 1 of them. Why? Well, if you were to write them all out, we know their sum has to be 1 for this one multinomial distribution. And if I know i times j of these minus 1 on 1, I know then the last one because that sum is equal to 1. Now, i, j, I times j minus 1 is greater than i plus j minus 2. Try some simple cases to see that. Um, and as i and j get larger and larger and larger, you can see there's a there becomes a big difference between the number of probabilities you need to know in order to understand the whole table. Um, there needs there ends up being a big difference for dependence versus independence. That's why we're interested in, in, in independence, because it really helps simplify our understanding of a contingency table. Okay, so in our previous R example that we had with one multinomial distribution, we looked at how we could actually simulate observations or cell counts in that particular case. Now let's say that um, independence was actually true. How could we take our corresponding probabilities that we had before and now simulate a contingency table, its set of counts, under independence. 
Well, we go back to then this expression. Pi sub ij is equal to pi i plus times pi plus j. So what I would need to do is let's let's find pi 1 plus. So I would look at this one, I would look at this one, and I would look at this one. What do I get? 0.5. How about we also look at pi plus 1? To do that, I would need to look at, let me get a highlighter out, this one and this one. Nice. It just so happens I end up with 0.5 as well. So if I multiply these two together under independence, pi 1, 1 would be 0.5 times 0.5 or 0.25. Now you could do that for all the other rows, all the other columns. Get these pi values under independence. And that's what you would use then with the R multinome function to simulate a contingency table under independence. This will be important later on in these notes. Okay, let me come back here. Okay. Oops, sorry, I went a little bit too far. Well, what happens in the particular case where we had I multinomial distributions? Okay. Now, back in section 1.2, we looked at the case where we had independent binomial sampling for two different rows. And we were very interested in that particular setting, is pi 1 equal to pi 2? We were looking at across the rows, are these probabilities equal to one another? Now in an I multinomial setting, then independence is actually equivalent to looking at these conditional probabilities and all these conditional probabilities being equal to one another. Notice what this means in a practical context. In terms of the, my probability of y getting, uh, getting a value of 1 or observing a value of 1, it doesn't matter which row we're in because the probabilities would be equal to one another. That's why we refer to this as independence as well. Now, while this is a little bit of a different, different definition, it's actually equivalent to what we just saw with the one multinomial distribution case. Let's look at why. So with the one multinomial distribution case, we have this expression right here. Pi sub ij is equal to pi sub i plus times pi sub plus j. That was independence. Now let's take a look at pi sub j given i here. In the context of what we just did, this is equal to pi sub i j divided by pi sub i plus. Why? It goes back to your intro stat course where you first learned about conditional probabilities. Now, under independence, I can substitute for pi sub i j, pi sub i plus times pi sub plus j. Look what happens. That disappears. And so what we're uh, left with then is that pi sub j given i is equal to pi sub plus j. Now, if each of these probabilities are equal to one another, then that means then they have to be equal to the marginal probability, where I don't care about what i is, the probability of observing y is equal to j is this. Okay, that is independence in this context of having i different multinomial distributions. Again, these e would be equal to one another across the different um, across the different values of, of of the rows. Okay, now. So we have two different ways to express independence. That's, that's fine. Um, I will often just work with that first way when I like, eventually when we do hypothesis tests and I state um, particular hypotheses, but just realize that everything is equivalent here. Either if you start with the one multinomial or the I multinomial case.
So on your own, you should think about how to answer this question. With the I multinomial distributions and what we had previously, how would you actually simulate a sample under independence? If you need a little bit of help, I actually show you how to do that in my corresponding program that we have been looking at previously for simulating observations from a multinomial distribution. Okay, now let's talk about how we can test for independence. So what this means is that my hypotheses are this. The null hypothesis is our definition of independence. You could write it either way. And the alternative hypothesis basically is that we have at least, let's say, uh, at least one not equal. Now to do this test, we're going to look at three different ways to do it. The first way is the most common way, the Pearson chi-square test for independence. We actually essentially did this already when we had a 2 by 2 contingency table. But now we're going to put it in a, a more general notational way. So what we first saw before, the Pearson chi-square test statistic cal is calculated as follows. Take your observed count in a contingency table, subtract off what you would estimate that expected count to be under the null hypothesis, square it, divide by the estimated expected count under the null hypothesis. And so what's happening here is that you're taking what you observe minus what you would expect if HO was true, independence was true. If these two items, once you square it, um, I'm sorry, if these two items are similar to one another, notice then I'm going to get a small number when I take the difference. If, however, they're far apart, I'm going to get a large number. Think about what that means in the context of testing for independence. If they are far apart, that means what you're observing is a lot different than what you would expect if HO is true. So what this, is, what this means then after you square it, you know, you're going to get a large number there. And that's going to lead then to a test statistic where you form the same quantity across every single cell of your table and sum them up. It's going to lead your test statistic to be large as well. So if we have a large test statistic, that means the null hypothesis is false. We have dependence. So here's formally then this Pearson chi-square test for independence. I'm sorry, Pearson statistic. I'm going to sum over all the rows, sum over all the columns. I'm going to take my cell count minus this estimated expected value under the null hypothesis, square it, divided by the estimated expected count again under the null hypothesis. Well, where does this count, where does this estimated count under the null hypothesis come from? <clears throat> well, again, under independence, pi sub i j is equal to pi i plus times pi plus j. Let's say I wanted to get a count under independence. All I would need to do is take my sample size, n, and multiply both sides. Now, under independence then, what happens then, what will be the estimate of it? Well, let's put hats on top of the, these estimate, uh, uh, on top of these marginal probabilities. Well, remember what pi hat sub i plus is from previous set of notes, n i plus divided by n, pi hat plus j, is n plus j divided by n. Then, because I have that n out there, one of these n's is going to cancel, and this is what I'm left with. n sub i plus times n sub plus j divided by n. Estimated expected count under the null hypothesis of independence. So, this way of writing x squared is equivalent to what we had seen in section 1.2 when we looked at the Pearson statistic as well. Now, x squared for a large sample has an approximate chi-squared distribution with i minus 1 times j minus 1 degrees of freedom for a large sample. And we know that this statistic is large only when there's deviation from independence based upon our discussion a few minutes ago. Therefore, what is large enough? Well, I use this 1 minus alpha quantile from the chi-square distribution to make that judgment. I can find a p-value in a very similar manner as well as you would normally find any kind of p-value. Okay. 
Now, you could also do this test with a Likert ratio test statistic. What is the Likert ratio? Well, we've seen that before. We use this uppercase lambda letter to help denote it. And so we need to find the likelihood function under HO and HA. We've seen the likelihood function written out previously relative to that multinomial distribution in a different set of notes. So this is what we would put in there. And then wherever you see a pi sub ij for under HO, I'm sorry, wherever you see a pi sub ij, when we want to find this numerator, we replace pi sub ij with pi sub i plus times pi sub plus j, or let's say the corresponding estimates, excuse me. That is the estimate under the null hypothesis. That's what's going to be the maximum possible value of the likelihood function under the null hypothesis. Then when we don't have that restriction, then we just take pi hat sub ij to be equal to n sub ij divided by n, our regular old maximum likelihood estimator. So once one does that and does some algebra, this is your negative 2 log lambda statistic. Notice again how we are making comparisons of the observed count with the estimated expected count under the null hypothesis. We now just have a weight out there corresponding to the actual uh, cell count. This negative 2 log lambda statistic for a large sample has a chi-square distribution once again under the null hypothesis with the degrees of freedom of i minus 1 times j minus 1. Speaking of degrees of freedom here, where does this degrees of freedom come from? It actually corresponds to something we were talking about earlier. A general way to find degrees of freedom for any problem is this. You take your number of free parameters under HA subtract off the number of free parameters if HO was true. So let's go back to where we were earlier. Now remember that, let me do a little bit of erasing here. Remember that if the null hypothesis is true, to get those joint probabilities, we only need to know the marginal ones. How many of the marginal ones? Well, remember we would only need i minus 1 of them for the rows, j minus 1 of them for the columns. So the number of free parameters under the null hypothesis is i plus j minus 2. Now without independence, we need to know again i, j minus 1 to get all the pi sub i, j's. So that's the number of free parameters under the alternative hypothesis. And so if I go back down to where we were, if I take i plus, oops, if I take i times j minus 1, subtract off i plus j minus 2, what do I get after some algebra? i minus 1 times j minus 1. That's where the degrees of freedom comes from. Also, these results rely on a large sample, meaning that the chi-square distribution is a good approximation for x squared or negative 2 log lambda if we have a large distribution. What does large mean? Well, some statistical research has shown that typically if you have your estimated expected cell count greater than 5, the chi-square distribution will work. Some people will say, oh, it only needs to be greater than 1 for it to work. Well, what if, though, these, let's say, recommendations here are not satisfied? What does that mean? That means that the chi-square distribution may be a poor approximation than for x squared under the null hypothesis. What are the practical applications? Well, you may reject HO, for example, when you shouldn't have. So you can make an error. And in fact, if the chi-square distribution is not good, often you will reject more often than what you should.
meaning you have a liberal test. Or in other words, your type 1 error rate is actually higher than what is actually stated. So this kind of corresponds to what we have been discussing in the past about a true confidence level versus the stated confidence level. You could have the, the true type 1 error rate versus the stated type 1 error rate as well. So in the end, you reject HO too often, typically, if this chi-square distribution approximation doesn't work, you're left with a liberal test. A conservative test would be one where you reject not enough. Given the choice between a conservative or a liberal test, typically you should always take a conservative test. So if the distribution approximation is in doubt, what can you do? Well, you can use a different inference method. You could use exact inference, similar to what we had used actually earlier with respect to like a Clopper-Pearson interval. Uh, most semesters, when I teach a corresponding categorical class, I will actually do a section of my notes on that. So stay tuned for that. Another approach is to use a Monte Carlo simulation method, where what you could do is simulate what that probability distribution should be for x squared or negative 2 log lambda, rather than use a chi-squared distribution approximation. And we will do that shortly. So let's take a look at an example here. This example deals with fiber-enriched crackers. Now, in many processed foods, uh, the manufacturers of that food product will put into it some extra fiber. Uh, because fiber is good for your body. Now, unfortunately, having too much fiber, though, has some side effects at times. And so, in this particular data here, um, a company was interested in developing a new kind of fiber-enriched cracker. And so what they did was, was that they gave this cracker to a number of people, and they observed the amount of bloating severity that the people experience. Now there was four different um, formulations of this cracker. One, there was actually no fiber in it. Uh, second, um, some extra bran was put in there as the fiber source. Third, some a version of what's called gum is put in there as a fiber source. And then lastly, both gran <laughs> bran and gum were put in there. Now, for example, four people who ate the, fiber, the, the crackers without any extra fiber put in there experienced some low bloating severity. So that's what this table is representing. Now, some comments before we get into the data analysis. Notice how the columns of this, of this table has some ordinal properties to it. Ideally, we, be able, we like to take advantage of that information. We will later when we re-examine this data set, but for now, we're going to examine as if there is no ordinal properties. Uh, in the end, this helps us see how there can be advantages of taking, a, um, taking that kind of information into account. Um, now, Given the layout of the data, it is likely that the sample size for each row was actually fixed beforehand. Now, where I found this particular data set, it, there wasn't information about were they using w essentially the one multinomial setting or the I multinomial setting. But given that the total uh, number of people represented in every row was 12, I wouldn't be surprised if they were doing this I multinomial setting. Now lastly, that fiber source could actually be analyzed as two separate explanatory variables, where you have bran, yes or no, gum, yes or no. In my book, I describe how, or actually I show, how one could actually analyze this data taking that into account. Um, in the end, I'm going to analyze this for our, 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 um, our set of notes as just one overall variable, because this is actually how I found the data um, uh, uh, when I came across it. It was 
put into a 4x4 contingency table like this. Okay, so let's talk about how we can um, get the data into the correct form that we need to analyze it. So the data is in a common delimited file called fiber.csv. Now inside this data set, or this file, there are variables named, uh, let me just get the exact name here, named fiber and bloat. Each of these has, let's say, character values for them, such as none, brand, gum, and both. So because of that, then I'm going to add this extra argument called strings as factors equal true to make sure that R reads in the data correctly and treats then these corresponding variables as factors. So let me go ahead and do that. And then I can type diet and here's my data. Now, put down my pen. If I were to look at then the levels of the fiber variable, fortunately I can't type very well. Notice the ordering of the levels. That doesn't match the ordering that we had in the contingency table. And while we could leave it as is, I want to be able to match what we had have in the contingency table. So because of that, then I'm going to use the factor function where I take fiber out of diet, my data frame that has the data in it. And then for the levels argument for fiber, I'm going to put them in the exact same order that we saw in the, in the contingency table. Now, bloating has a very similar issue with it too, so I'm going to reorder those, and here we go. Now, of course, the data frame itself doesn't look like it has changed at all, but if I were to say levels diet dollar sign fiber, now we can see that we have the order that matches the contingency table. Lastly, I like to be able to put this this data instead of a data frame, but into a contingency table format. So I can use a function we've discussed before called xtabs to do that. Remember xtabs stands for cross tabulations. Here's a review of how we can use this function. I say xtabs and then I have a formula argument. Now since I know what the counts are for each fiber and bloating combination, I say count, which is a variable again, that's in my data frame, count tilde, my row variable, plus my column variable, there's where my data's in, and if I put that all into diet.table, there's my corresponding contingency table that matches in the notes. Okay. Now let's talk about how we can do a hypothesis test for independence here. We can use a function called chi-square.test that we actually saw in section 1.2 to do the test as well. We use it for a two by two table then, but it can work for larger tables. So I say chi-square.test, the X argument corresponds to my contingency table, and then I always need to add this extra part here, correct equal false. The default is correct equal true, and what that does, it changes the numerator of my test statistics slightly in a way that I actually don't want. Um, and unfortunately, that's the default. Um, it applies what's often referred to as a continuity correction factor, which uh, nowadays are, are not needed in statistics. And so I say, don't do it, correct equal false. I put the results into an object called in.test, could have used a different name. And then if I just simply type in.test, this is what I get. So then my Pearson statistic is 16.9. Here's my degrees of freedom, four minus one times four minus one. Here's my p-value calculated as the probability a chi-square random variable with nine degrees of freedom, let's call it A, is greater than 16.94. That p-value is about 0 0.05. So let's just say A has a distribution of chi-square nine. Okay, now 
the results in in.tests are actually stored in a list format. You could type names, parentheses, in.tests, and, and parentheses to see everything that's stored in there. One thing that I want to bring to your attention that is stored in there are the estimated expected counts under the null hypothesis. And notice all of these end up being less than five. And so based upon one of the criteria that I showed you before, where it says where we just maybe just had one that was less than five, but now all of them are, that should be like that should be a little bit of a warning to you that hey, maybe this chi-square approximation cannot be trusted. And in fact, because of what is in the expected component of in dot test, R actually prints a warning message about that. We'll explore that more later. Now to do the Likert ratio tests, one main way to do that is to use a user contributed package that you would need to download and, and install. Uh, it's called VCD for Visualize Categorical Data. And in here we can see here's my Pearson statistic. Here is now my negative 2 log lambda statistic. Here's the p-value 0 0.026 for the Likert ratio test. And we see that again we have a similar result. In both cases, in case I didn't say it first with the original case, in both cases we have marginal evidence against independence. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And lastly, one other quick little way to do this. Now, since I use the xTabs function to form my diet.table contingency table, R actually assigns a set of classes to it corresponding to what xTabs does. It actually assigns two different classes, xTabs and table. And if I were to take summary diet table, R will, again, summary is a generic function, R will look to see is there a summary.xtaps function and execute that. There isn't. But there is a summary.table method function that actually then computes then the Pearson chi-squared test statistic, it computes the p-value and so on. And so this matches what we had before. If one wanted to get the critical value from the chi-squared distribution, you can use the q chi sq function, q for quantile, 0.95 quantile, degrees of freedom 9, 16.91. So, my two test statistics, my critical value, here are my two p values. Again, marginal evidence of dependence, marginal evidence that bloating severity is affected by the type of fiber that's included in the cracker. Of course, now you might want to follow up on this to determine, well, what kind of cracker formulation is causing this? We will talk about ways to do that in another set of notes. Okay, so we had some concern about this chi-square approximation. So what we're gonna end the set of notes with is a way that one could evaluate is that chi-square approximation trustworthy for this particular data set? And to do this, we're going to essentially use Monte Carlo simulation to simulate what the actual true distribution is for x squared or negative 2 log lambda. So in other words, this is how it's going to work. I'm going to simulate a contingency table in this data setting you know, with a particular sample size, with our particular count that we're actually observed. I'm going to simulate now a uh, new contingency table, assuming the null hypothesis is true, and I'm going to calculate the x squared statistic on it. Since this is on simulated data, I'm going to call it x squared star to help differentiate it from my observed value of x squared. Then I'm going to simulate once again a contingency table under the null hypothesis using this particular data setup. 
and then calculate x squared star on it again. And I'm going to do this a large number of times, so I'm going to get a lot of x squared stars. Then what I'm going to do is do a histogram of all those x squared stars. And maybe it might look something like this. This then is a simulated distribution for what the true distribution is for x squared under the null hypothesis. And if I wanted to evaluate how well a chi-square 9 distribution works, what I could do is actually plot the chi-square 9 distribution on it. And if I were to get something like, uh, let me do a gray, gray pen here. If I were to get something like, you know, let me get a different color, excuse me. Let's look at orange. Okay, unfortunately my pens are not working exactly that way I want, so we'll try purple this time. And if I got something that looked like this for my chi-square distribution, then what that would tell me is, okay, that chi-square distribution could be uh, trusted. And if instead I get something like here in green, suppose I get a distribution that looks like this, then I would be very worried about the chi-square distribution because it's not matching what my simulated distribution is. And so that's the reason why we're doing this, is to see, can we trust this chi-square distribution approximation? Now, an interesting thing, though, that occurs by doing this as well, let me do some erasing, is that, well, why do we even need to compare to a chi-square? Because what we could do is just use this simulated distribution for inferences instead. And we can do that. We can calculate a p-value from this. So for example, if my test statistic, my actual observed test statistic fell way out on the right side, what that would tell me is that my, res my observed test statistic is unusual. It's very, very unlikely to have a test statistic that large in size if the null hypothesis is true. So therefore, reject HO. If instead my test statistic, let's say, fell more in the middle of the distribution, then I would say, oh, okay, you know, that seems reasonable, so don't reject HO. There's not evidence that dependence occurs because this would be a, a value of x squared that is, is reasonable. It, it, it would be expected to have something like that. And so that's how this Monte Carlo simulation then can be turned into a way to do a hypothesis test to calculate a p-value. Okay, so that's some background. Here's the formal procedure that one uses here. Simulate a large number of contingency tables of size n, assuming the null hypothesis is true. We've talked about that already, about how to simulate data using the R multinome function, assuming the null hypothesis, I'm sorry, under independence. Okay? And so the key difference, though, is that we're going to set, let's say under one multinomial setting, we're going to set pi sub i j to be equal to what the estimated probability would be under the null hypothesis. In other words, we are going to take i pi sub i pi hat sub i plus times pi hat sub plus j. If you simplify that, you get n i n sub i plus times n sub plus j divided by n squared. A lot of subscripts to say to say sometimes it's hard to say them all. We can do something similar then under the I multinomial setting. It doesn't matter which you pick, you'll get, you'll get the same results. And I'm going to simulate, let's say, capital B of these contingency tables. Then for each contingency table, I'm going to calculate x squared each time, or you could do likelihood ratio tests as well. And we're going to call these x squared stars to help differentiate them from the original x squared. Then I can do a plot of the x squared stars, compare it to a chi squared distribution to make a judgment of, well, how well does that chi squared distribution work? And then lastly, if I want to calculate a p value here associated with this, I need a measurement of how extreme is my x squared. How extreme is my x squared? So, in other words, I'm just going to simply find the proportion of my x squared stars that are greater than what that x squared is. Um, in a non-mathematical way, you could say the number of these x squared stars that are greater than or equal to what your observed x squared was divided by b. If you wanted to put in a little bit more mathematical context, let's say 
I'm going to uh, come up with b equal or little b equal to one to capital B different x squared stars. And I'm going to then use the indicator function to help me determine when is x squared star greater than or equal to x squared. That would be a more formal way to do this. Okay. Now, there can be times where some simulated contingency tables are not actually the full size, meaning that you might not have any observations in a particular row or any observations in a particular column. In other words, the counts are all zeros. What should you do in those situations? Well, throw those contingency tables out. The reason being is because if we wanted to make a comparison to a chi-square distribution with a particular number of degrees of freedom, basically what this is saying is that that chi-square distribution is changing because the size of the, of the contingency, contingency table is changing. If there happens to be a lot of these contingency tables that are thrown out, then you probably shouldn't use this kind of Monte Carlo simulation. Instead, there are other methods that you can use to make the same kind of valuation. Okay. So let's now take a look at this with respect to that fiber cracker uh, data that we looked at before. The computational details, how to program all this in R, is in my program. I'm not going to talk about it here in this video. If you're taking a categorical course from me right now and you want to talk about the details, please ask during our class. Here are the actual results from using my program. On the left side, we have this histogram of the x squared stars. The red line corresponds to my chi-square distribution. And we can see that indeed, the chi-square distribution is very similar to this simulated distribution under the null hypothesis. So therefore, I can trust the results from this Pearson chi-square test for independence. I can, and if you were to do this with a negative two long land with statistic, you'll come up with the same conclusion. So in the end, my actual observed value of x squared was 16.94. So it's right about there. And about 5% of these x squared stars are greater than, than it. And specifically 0 0.0446. Notice how that's very similar to the p-value that we had previously with the chi-squared distribution approximation, which is what we would expect because we see a lot of similarity there. Now, a little bit of a side note here. If another way to evaluate how good that chi-square 9 distribution is, is instead of doing a histogram and plotting the probability density function on top of it, one could do a similar thing using the cumulative distribution function. So in red here, we have the CDF of the chi-square 9 distribution. In black, I have what's called the empirical CDF for these x squared stars. How is this empirical or ECDF found? Well, simply, if we take a look at, let's say, 10, project up, project over, what that basically means is about 60% of my um, x squared stars are less than 10. Oh, about 100% of my x squared stars are less than 20. So essentially what R does to find an ECDF, it just estimates the proportions that are less than a particular uh, numerical value uh, throughout the different possible values of the x-axis. That's all. Again, you can see the code in my program. Okay. So I've already kind of talked about this note here. Um, so in the end, this concludes in this section about how or uh, concludes a section on what does independence mean in terms of a mul one multinomial distribution setting, an I multinomial distribution setting, and then how we can test for independence as well.